We're ready to start our third annual Ideal Summit. Uh, buenas tardes, bonjour, ni hao. Uh, today we're going to focus on a particular theme which is rethinking the local, reimagining libraries in a flattening world. And we want to be able to do this because we know how important uh, with globalization that we think about not only what we do here but how it matters to places that are beyond our geographic area. And the ideal summit that we do focuses on the areas of information, diversity, engagement, and access, and libraries. So to be able to do this, we uh, kind of do a world cafe style, meaning that we find our answers or we explore the issues in conversation. So today we're gonna have a panel. Uh, we preceded this with poster sessions and then we will have breakout groups uh, so we can have dialogue and then come up with some particular ideas that we share in a plenary session at the end. So I just wanted to welcome everyone. I'm Clara Chu, Department Chair of Library and Information Studies at the University of North Carolina, Greensboro. And now I'm going to turn things over to, uh, before we do that actually, the two uh, conference uh, or summit organizers are Dr. Nora Bird and Dr. Jim Carmichael. And I also would like to thank the rest of the organizing committee and planning committee. If you can stand up so we can give you a round of applause. Come on, don't be shy. Thank you so much for your participation, and uh, now I'll turn things over to Nora. Um, hello, you have in your packet a um, program schedule, uh, which should look uh, very much like this. Um, so at um, 2.15, we will um, be breaking, but um, basically just to move to your dialogue sessions. And you have a sheet in your packet that says um, what the different uh, dialogue sessions are and you also have a dot on your uh, packets on the front of your pa packets and I will give you the code for the dots at the end of um, this session um, and at um, we will go to those dialogue sessions and then we will have a uh, real break at 3.30 where we will have cake and um, award the prizes for the um, poster session, I hope you enjoyed the poster session. And then uh, we will have the plenary session um, from about 3.45 or 4. Um, and we will also, just before that session, we'll have a greeting from our dean, um, Dean Karen Wixon, who is the dean of the uh, School of Education. Um, so um, are any of you tweeters? Um, if you are, you can, um, tweet about this session um, under this hashtag, I, um, ideals. Um, I barely know what that means, but um, some of you <laughs> may know better. And so um, we'd love to hear what you have to say about the sessions as a way of um, communicating with us um, as you are watching the sessions. And um, finally, um, we will be having a speaker from South Africa. Um, um, mic'd in um, from there, and um, he can actually hear us. Um, say hello to Dr. Peter Lohr. Say, everybody say hello. Hello. Um, and, um, hello. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And um, so we will, um, he, I will turn this over to Jim, and Jim is going to uh, introduce the speakers. Is that right? That's right. Oh, okay. Of course, never lose a minute to say something of my own, which is that this is probably the most distinguished panel I've ever seen in our library school since I've been here. Um, not only is the most distinguished panel, uh, when I went to library school in 1978, there were exactly zero courses in uh, wh what we called then international librarianship. Uh, we could not imagine a time in 1978, just barely, when things would not be as they always were. So today is a celebration of the fact that we got out of that horrible mold. And uh, I'm gonna, you can read uh, the very extensive vitas 
uh, that we have here, and I'm just going to briefly introduce uh, our speakers. First, we have Dr. Peter Lohr from South Africa, who is a fellow baby boomer, and he is, uh, has been everywhere and done everything. He's best known as a state librarian of South Africa and uh, a big wig uh, in IFLA. Now, IFLA is the International Federation of Library Associations, which you don't hear much about unless you're in Clara Chu's class. But it is the most important information policy setting board uh, in the world for our field. And um, uh, through his extensive experience in libraries in South Africa and in Europe, uh, Dr. Lohr is well qualified to be our keynote today. And um, second, we have uh, here in Greensboro, uh, Dr. Ismail uh, Abdul Ali, who is from North Carolina Central University and is one of those heroes who teaches a course in global librarianship. And uh, although he went to the Royal College of Denmark, uh, he has spent uh, uh, a great deal of his life in Egypt and in, um, in North America. And uh, he's a well-known authority on library education and global issues. And finally, we have Amanda Click, who is a graduate of this program, I'm glad to say. But even before then, she was a rambling wreck from Georgia Tech. <laughs> and you know, what, what, what wrong can she do? I used to cheer for Georgia Tech, the only football team I ever cheered for before they became professional. <laughs> and uh, uh, so Amanda uh, had the unusual career path of going to the American University in Cairo immediately after graduation. And has, I, I think we're gonna have a hard time keeping her in the United States. Um, but uh, she's going back to Cairo for Christmas, by the way. And um, along with um, Mohammed Bere, who's in the audience today and was one of our students, and Sinem Ajar, who uh, helped greet some of you when you came in this morning from Istanbul, uh, we have a very uh, broad uh, representation geographically and globally today. So I'm going to turn uh, the mic over to uh, Dr. Peter Lohr in South Africa, and he's going to open up the discussion and then we'll move down the panel one by one. Thank you. Well, hello, and uh, thank you very much for your introduction, and also thank you very much for um, your, the invitation to participate in this conference. I've switched on my video. I hope you can see me. I'm hearing a bad echo of myself, but if you don't hear an echo, that's fine. Um, just for uh, on the matter of audio, um, I could hear, uh, I think, uh, Nora, it was, very clearly. Uh, Clara, I think, at the beginning was very indistinct. I'm just mentioning that so you can bear that in mind when you position yourself at the microphones. Um, Hello, if you can't hear me, please uh, send me a, a message on the chat screen and I will become then remedy that. I'm not sure whether you can hear me at the moment. Yes. Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. It, <laughs> it, it takes a bit of getting used to. So a little bit of murmuring in the background will probably help me. Um, my, my initial contribution will be a response in the form of a bit of critical exegesis of the conference announcement, uh, which is not meant to be criticism, but really a response. And the conference announcement speaks of the promise of democratization of information. It speaks of free flow. It speaks of at least a rudimentary form of, of universal communication. And it mentions, I think, quite correctly, the economic the legal and the educational barriers with which you know we, we have to deal. Um, I'd like to start by commenting on the notion of a, a flattening world. And you know, you will recall that this uh, notion, I think, I assume that your reference to it is to the book by the New York Times columnist uh, Thomas Friedman. Uh, his book was, I think, very political, uh, very uh, um, concerned with uh, the political and economic 
uh, impacts of the, the end of the Cold War, the fall of the Berlin Wall, and so forth. And I think he sees uh, flattening largely in terms of, of globalization 3.0, as he calls it. He talks about, he's got 10 points, and among them you find a point about supply chains, the outsourcing of work to countries in which labor is cheap, the entry on the scene of a huge pool of talent uh, uh, of people from non-Western countries, and um, it's, a, it's very much a United States perspective. Uh, it, it, there is a threat to the United States business and to United States economic supremacy. Now, in response to uh, Friedman's book, there has been some skepticism as well. Uh, it's been suggested that uh, communication is still overwhelmingly local, uh, that the degree of flattening has been exaggerated. There's been some criticism as well as of the rather non-exclusive American perspective and of the rather alarmist uh, approach. Now, people like being scared, as we know, it, it sells books and movies. Um, but uh, the economist Stiglitz has said that, in fact, uh, the world is not getting flatter, and in parts the world is getting less flat. And I'll come back to that idea a little bit later. So I suppose I have to say that I'm uncomfortable with the notion of a flattening world. And to me, it's redolent of a sort of a mix of technological determinism and Darwinism, the survival of the fittest uh, idea. And one can't open an LIS magazine or journal nowadays without being offered someone's breathless version of adapt or die. <laughs> um, the percentage of articles dealing with various forms of technology in, in LIS journals in library association programs and in LIS school curricula is, is very large. And this is almost reminiscent, I suppose I sound like a Luddite when I say this, but it's almost reminiscent to me of the earliest library schools which had a heavy concentration on library technology, like learning to write out catalog cards in a very legible library hand. What we're seeing today is a modern equivalent of learning to write a library hand. So sure, technology is changing rapidly, and we have to stay ahead. Um, but I sometimes fear that we are getting distracted and losing sight of our values. And we, we, we're having an increasing superficiality of what the values of librarianship are about. So if the superficiality is flattening, okay, then we certainly are seeing flattening. There are people who have an interest in making us anxious and unsettled. The, uh, this sort of of adapt or die discourse in which we are indulging uh, as a profession uh, sets us up for exploitation by the capitalists who want us to keep spending, spending, spending on bigger and better technology all the time. And it makes assumptions about the nature of human society and culture, about the inevitability of progress, uh, the idea that this is convergence. We will all become more and more alike and be behave more and more like one another, specifically more and more like Americans. I'm sorry if I sound a little bit cynical there. <laughs> I want to say that communication doesn't necessarily bring about understanding. You know, information doesn't necessarily bring about friendship or solidarity or ensure world peace. And some of you may be old, to old enough to remember the time of Leonid Brezhnev, who was a real hardcore old style communist. who was someone you really didn't like to see. Uh, he was presiding over the Soviet Union, then he died, and he was succeeded by Yuri Andropov. Whoa, the analyst said. This guy loves jazz, and he has cats. He's human, so we can do business with him. Well, we didn't. <laughs> you know, some generals in Myanmar, in, in the Slok, the junta, made love to these cats, and some Argentinian generals who were in the junta back in the time of the military dictatorship surely loved horses, and all of them loved their grandkids, as did the kingpins of the South African apartheid regime, but they were not lovable, not to us anyway. And more recently, this has been demonstrated by the Muslim fundamentalists in, in Afghanistan and Pakistan, etc. They use modern communication channels, but to their own ends. And I suppose while I'm here, I need to refer to the Arab Spring, which is held up as an example of the democratizing effect of social networking technology. 
a prime example of, I think, of technological determinism. Well, those BlackBerry armed yuppies certainly made a big impact on Tahrir Square in Cairo, but it remains to be seen what sort of democracy will emerge in Egypt and who will actually come out on top. That's not nearly as well determined. So you refer in the announcement to the disappearance of international librarianship, uh, and you define it as, bridge, as the bridging of linguistic, cultural, and political differences across national borders. Um, we can argue about that, but it certainly is one of the major motivations for the study of international uh, uh, librarianship. And I, I want to, at this point, just slip in the word comparative. And, and what I'm going to say for the rest of this session will really refer to international and comparative librarianship. But I'm not going to subject, subject you to, a, to a, uh, an analysis of the terminology. We've spent far too much time on that already in, in the profession. Subdisciplines and interdisciplinary fields like comparative education, comparative uh, politics, comparative librarianship, and then also interdisciplinary fields like area studies have waxed and waned in response to political trends uh, which determine funding priorities and the availability of research grants, among others, as well as in response to disciplinary phenomena. Think, for example, of the impact of global studies on area studies in the United States. So there has indeed been a decline in international and comparative librarianship, and I think there are a number of reasons for that that we, we need to, to look at. Um, I think one of them, of course, is the political one. We, we saw the conservative trend towards isolationism and exceptionalism, uh, the, the Reagan and Thatcher years, the withdrawal of the United States, the United Kingdom, and Singapore too, by the way, from UNESCO um, in the 1980s. And then, Secondly, the millennial expectations that ICTs will, will solve all problems, and that was referred to in, in the announcement. Um, we are distracted by globalization. Globalization, by the way, has had a huge impact on comparative education. It's opened up comparative education and also diluted it at the same time. We've been distracted as a profession also by multicultural librarianship. We group multicultural and international librarianship together. Um, and then we have the confusion of, of international librarianship and foreign librarianship, which is the result of the meaning of the word international in, in the United States. Then I think more fundamentally we have the discrediting of librarianship and library science being supplanted by information science or information studies. And then perhaps most importantly, I would say, the almost total failure uh, to develop any sort form of, of theoretical basis for international and comparative uh, uh, librarianship. If we compare that with the situation in comparative education, which is a big field and has several journals devoted to it, there's a ferment of ideas, there's a huge range of critical approaches to the positivist methodology, to the neoliberal theories of development. We see them adopting new Marxist ideas, critical theory, post-colonial theory, feminist theory, and so forth. Uh, in very, very interesting studies are being done in comparative education uh, on, uh, for example, policy borrowing and, and development. And we haven't seen that happening in LIX at all, at least very, very little. And then, as a result, in our field, a lot of comparative studies and international studies are being undertaken, but they're being undertaken on a sort of a, based on a sort of naive empiricism or on an avowed atheoretical theory-less basis. But actually, a, an, an atheoretical approach is also a theoretical position. So that leads us to a, a serious degree of shallowness in our field. I'm devoting what is left of my scholarly career to working in the field of international and comparative librarianship, um, writing a book at the moment concentrating on conceptual issues. Not that I think I will be able to produce the conceptual uh, uh, reference framework, but to try and res restore some sort of theoretical basis or at least open up a range of, of possible theoretical frameworks that will stimulate much more inter interesting research than the research that we have, most of the research that we've done, <coughs> done to date. Uh, um, all is not lost. Uh, in the European Union, 
uh, as a result in Europe, and as, as a result of the breakdown of the Soviet Union, the enlargement of the European Union, this has given a big impact to comparative and international studies in Europe. Think of the need to harmonize national, educational, health, taxation, uh, legal systems, and so forth, and policies. Of course, the Euro crisis shows us that they still have some ways to go. An example in our own field is the Bologna process, which is concerned with the harmonization of education in our field. So there's a lot of interest in that in Europe, and interestingly enough, a lot of it in Italy, for example, which has hardly been seen in the past as a country with a great degree of international outreach. So I think at this point I'll stop and I'll weigh in later when we talk specifically about the three questions listed in the announcement. I just want to uh, ask you uh, how I can attract your attention when I want to speak. If someone is uh, looking at the chat box, uh, then I will, um, uh, then I will uh, uh, make a point there to tell you I'd like to make a contribution. So for now, thank you for me. Peter, we will be monitoring your uh, chat box, and um, we will also, um, you can also go to www.uncg, no, www.lis.uncg slash live. Um, that's our Ustream link to this, and you will be able to see Dr. Abdullahi's slides um, from that link. Um, and. Um, I believe now, and we will keep the audio on as I just have, and um, I believe Dr. Abdullahi will speak next, and I will uh, set up his slides. Good afternoon. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, and thank you for your invitation. Uh, speaking about global library information science, uh, let me just start on this slide that tells us that today we have a world population of, I think we just became seven billion, seven billion. And then by 2050, according to the U.S. Census, uh, we are going to be probably nine billion. That's the way we have to look at the globe when we say global. Uh, thanks. Out of this seven billion people on this planet, more than two-thirds of them live in developing world. About a billion people are illiterate. Most of them are in developing world. Of all the illiterate adults in the world, two-thirds are women. That is our family of the globe. Now how do we connect how do we work together on this planet is a responsibility of each one of us. And when we look from LIS profession, it includes also all this information. First, of course, we need to understand, I will look at it because since this is a very short presentation, from a cultural point of view. Uh, in my 30 years of involvement in LIS education around the world, one area that I have seen that needs to be understood very well is the culture, because people's culture are very important. It is their belief, it is their way of life, it is their behavior, and everything. So we look at it from intercultural point of view. That means when we talk about global, how do we collaborate, how do we work together, and how do we understand each other? And how do we also establish that competency of cultural? Because if you don't understand the other person on the other side of the wallet, then you are not going to succeed in anything that you do. 
That is very important, competency to have that. Next. So cultural competency means possessing a social intelligence inside and being able to express or communicate that intelligence in meaning ways, or being able to participate in the everyday web of social res uh, relationships, even at a limited or reduced level. That is very important when you want to, to go out global, to have that kind of competency. And becoming also global competent means developing a non-judgmental relations. It is very important to have an attitude toward the other rather than just to always oneself. Also having an understanding of one's own cultural norms and expectation. What is your norm? Understanding also cultural norms and expectation of those outside also one's cultural box when we talk about it. Recognition that one's own world view is not universal because people have their own views in other parts of the world. Recognition of ethnic differences. The world is made up also of various kinds of ethnic differences and how do we understand and how do we communicate with them. So that is very important. So also the path to intercultural understanding when we talk about it, first of course you have to be, you have to have an awareness that you have to know that these people you are going to communicate with, you are going to work with, and then develop some kind of cultural knowledge in many ways. It requires that, that you have to have some kind of a skill because that will enable you to have some kind of tolerance because what we lack today in the world, if you ask me, in many ways is that part, tolerance. And that comes because of not having enough awareness. Then with the tolerance comes cultural competency in many ways. That one becomes competent, he understands, he can communicate, she can communicate, he can communicate, and collaboration can be established. That uh, uh, Dr. Lohr is talking about and Friedman is talking about flattening of the world it does not happen if that understanding is not really in place in many ways. Otherwise, you are going to face a lot of mountains. Pass to misunderstanding on the other side that creates many times conflict is one is apathy, of course, which is also ignorance. Creates what? A stereotype. You know, they are like that. They are such. They are such. We can't fit there. You know, all those kinds of things we, we, we hear on daily basis, even from the media. Many times when I hear the media, I'm just uh, say, what's going on? then it creates also misunderstanding, conflict, and violence instead of collaboration, instead of that competency of understanding in many ways. So the issue of global and international when we talk about, that means you have to switch, you have to change the gear from nationally oriented field of study to international. That means you have to look in the global perspective rather than just from a narrow point of view of probably your own. <coughs> no. Then if we take, for example, <coughs> countries like, example, Federal Republic of Germany, the United States, or you know some, uh, let us say, Western countries versus Kuwait, India, South Africa, and Argentina. I'm talking about students in this part of the world. Probably the students from Federal Republic of Germany and the United States, probably they will learn only about their own cultures, about their own issues, about their own views, about their own opinions. But the students in Kuwait, India, and the, the South Africa, probably they will learn also not only of their own, if they have enough resources, but they will learn more about United States, more about Europe, maybe other, another part of the world. So automatically, through the education that they get, they, also believe, uh, uh, they are also exposed into international arena. So we have, to think, we have to think of that also, the kind of education we learn here. Does that expose us to international views, to international opinions? Or it just gives us our own in many ways. It doesn't really include us 
with other parts of the wallet. That's when we talk about globalization because others have a better an, uh, advantage over us in many ways. <clears throat> so global librarianship, when we say, is the process by which a nationalistic library school topic, an entire curriculum or an entire school is changed into one with a significant and varied international trust. The process by which it is permitted with international policies, viewpoints, ideas, facts, and so on. So if we wanted to move into global librarianship or information science, then all these views in other parts of the world has to be in included. So that means a change from national to an international mode. So you have to shift the gear in many ways. You have to shift, okay? Moving from national concentration to international uh, concentration in, 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 in many ways. <coughs> Some of the challenges and, and, and barriers in accessing information if we talk about uh, with other parts of, of, of the world, a lack of good computer environment, for example, if you talk about developing countries, uh, poor developed telecommunication infrastructure. We have to understand that also what lies on the other side of the world, especially in the form of challenges, okay? So it is not things are the same that we have here. Few qualified people to maintain equipment, for example, you have large literate or semi-literate population. Uh, many times also, as we know, probably uh, Dr. Lowe knows this better when he was the Secretary General, if a lack of foreign exchange is also a big problem. Lack of national information policies, for example, in many nations things are restricted, uh, websites are blocked, uh, there is a lot of censorship, that kind of thing. Lack of ability to upgrade obsolete equipment, those are just some of the challenges. Next. Other current problems you can look especially when looking at from developing countries, is deregulation of economic activities, for example, privatization of functions once public, for example, like education, healthcare, commercialization of activities once social, for example. There is also a change there with this globalization we are talking about. The World Bank's structural adjustment program that mandate also privatization. Uh, currency devaluation, removal of trade restriction, cuts in subsidies, severe reduction of services such as health and, and education. Those are also the challenges in many ways when you are trying to uh, create collaboration. What has changed? What have we changed? What did this globalization has changed? The, even the existing infrastructure that has been uh, they got it from let us say, even from colonial time, in many ways, has uh, changed. In addition, also, aid comes also with Eurocentric cultural strings attached. For example, they say this is the way you do it, this is the way you will succeed, in many ways, transfer one, from one culture into another culture, and that culture creates also a problem with the existing culture, so we have to study that. Worse, corporate media has the power to choose what ideas to present and regulate, what people think and believe, the media has become also today uh, in that way. We could see f for us who, who have come from probably from another culture, from another people, we see it in everyday media. The way media, for example, manipulates uh, this area in uh, creating uh, those gaps of misunderstanding. Transitional corporations, we also electronic uh, information as a commodity rather than public good in many ways. Uh, share problems of language and local content. The great majority of content is still provided from Europe and North America. The language is English. The language is also French uh, uh, in some instance or Spanish or Portuguese in many ways. So the larger group of people that I mentioned in the world population are left out. They are not really in the world that we are in today, we have also to understand that when we talk about uh, global. So why it is important for libraries and librarians to think globally? One, information is becoming internationalized. 
in many ways. Here we can communicate even with South Africa live. Uh, global interdependent has become both in trade. Look at the financial. One country that can shock the whole world financial situation and turn the markets upside down, a country called Greece. Okay, how big is Greece, if you know, compared to even the 50 states of the United States? It's just a small country, so that shows you the, the connection. By observing how libraries in other countries serve their patrons, evolving digital uh, environment, we see the rapid transformation of library from building to a gateway with access to worldwide also information. Another also global librarianship challenges, if we look at the challenges, are language, of course, language. I mean, how do you communicate if you don't speak the language of the other or if they don't speak your language? So that should be well in many ways. Uh, 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 we have to put a big note there. Access to resources is also a big challenge from other parts of the world. Uh, the digital divide, I mean, we can talk about this, you know, for days about the, the digital divide because things are not really technologically savvy at the way we have a lot of countries, a lot of people have a problem with this uh, internet, electronic, and all these good things, technology we have around here with ICTs. Of course, the other thing is also intellectual freedom in many ways. In many parts of the world, it, it doesn't exist. There is a lot of censorship. There is a lot of uh, blocking. Uh, there is a lot of uh, forbidden uh, 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 opinions and ideas. Then another also challenges international standards and guidelines in many ways uh, that we, each country follows it its own. Uh, although we have uh, organizations like IFLA, UNESCO, and so on, but. Uh, <coughs> You know, they are just doing their best. Cooperation among libraries that, uh, uh, that crosses traditional international boundaries also, in many ways, uh, is not that much strong, uh, in many ways. Um, another is the emerging digital library. So all these things that I have just thrown out is something that we need to think about when we say, we want to have global library information science. We want to go global, or we want to learn global uh, in many ways. I think I will stop here, and then uh, uh, we'll take questions and answers. Yes. Thank you. OK, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Amanda Click. I'm really excited to be back here. I haven't been back to Greensboro since I moved back to the States this summer. So it was a fabulous opportunity to come over and see everyone and be a part of this panel. So as Dr. Carmichael said, I finished uh, my MLIS here at UNCG in 2008, and I took my first job out of grad school at the American University in Cairo as an instruction and reference librarian and then the coordinator of instruction. So I was there for three years. Uh, each year was progressively more exciting. The first year, we moved from the old campus on Tahir, I'm sure all of you are familiar with Tahir now, to a new campus out in the desert, which was a big ordeal. The second year, we had the swine flu. And the third year, we had a revolution. So it was a pretty exciting experience, and I'm, I'm a uh, I am so glad I made the decision to go to, to go abroad, and I'm really excited about it, and I'm not gonna talk about that right now, but if any grad students here are interested in that and want to hear more, get in touch with me. I'm more than happy to, to talk to you about that. So, now I am back in North Carolina, a few miles down the road, starting a PhD at Chapel Hill at the School of Information and Library Science at uh, UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, Briefly, I want to tell you about the fellowship that I'm a part of because I think it's really related to what we're talking to, talking about today. I am an ELIME fellow, which means educating librarians in the Middle East. So a big part of, uh, of my fellowship and my funding is related to developing library curriculum with our partners in the Middle East and North Africa. And I think I, I will return to that more a little bit later. Um, uh, my research interests include information literacy in the Arab world, library services for non-native English speakers, development of the teacher librarian, 
uh, assessment of instruction. These are all things that I've been focusing on uh, over, over the last few years and will continue to be focusing on throughout my, my uh, new phase of education. So I'm, I'm going to talk to you um, about the things that I observed and the things that I learned while working in Egypt. So um, I think I'm going to take a, a pretty practical angle here. So uh, first I'll talk about some of the barriers to, uh, barriers to information, um, which are referenced in the, in the description for this panel, so, or for this summit today. Uh, first, it's important to think about economic barriers, right? Um, in Egypt, for example, high-speed internet is available, and it's pretty decent. And from my perspective, it was pretty cheap. It was pretty inexpensive. However, you know, it was, it was inexpensive and it was affordable for a foreigner living there, but that doesn't make it accessible to uh, the vast majority of the Egyptian population. Uh, I also want to say uh, some of my observations about Egypt can be applied a little more broadly to, what, when I say MENA, I mean Middle East, North Africa, so to the MENA region or possibly even to developing countries in general. So. Uh, I'm, I'm going to share with you observations about Egypt, some of which I also observed elsewhere in that part of the world that can probably be applied more broadly, but I'm, I'm not making overarching assumptions about um, every library in every developing country in the world. Um, so back, back to the internet. Uh, in Egypt, the estimated, uh, the estimated internet user per 100 inhabitants was only 1% in 2000. It went up to 4% in 2004, and by 2009, it was up to 24%. So just for, for the sake of comparison, in 2009, the internet penetration in the United States was 78%. So um, obvious economic issues, access to computers, just to the equipment, um, access to the internet, even access to power in, in some parts of the country. As far as legal and political issues, uh, Egypt was, uh, Egypt, the, the government in Egypt did not censor, did not directly censor the internet. So I never tried to go to a blog or go to a website that I could not access. However, Mubarak's regime did follow a, hand, a, a number of bloggers that were critical of the government. They followed them very closely and these folks were arrested regularly. If, I mean, for years and years prior to the revolution, this has been, that was part of Mubarak's regime, part of their, their cracking down technique. Um, a lot of you probably saw in the news that the internet was turned off during the revolution. I woke up one morning, I woke up on a Friday morning, it was the day of rage, and our internet and cell phones had all been turned off. The, the cell phones just remained off for a couple days, the internet a little bit longer. Um, and one thing that I thought was particularly interesting about that, Dr. Lohr mentioned the role of social networking in the Arab Spring and in these different revolutions. I've read, and, and obviously that, was, that, was, that played a large role and that's an important way for people to communicate, especially this, the particular group of, of young Egyptians who were protesting in Tahrir and, and leading, leading the movement. I have read recently a couple uh, social scientists who are, uh, who are theorizing that the government turning off the internet and turning off these communication devices actually increased participation in the revolution. So if you can't text your friend who's in Tahrir, well then you might just have to go down there and find them, right? So the, the, there hasn't been a lot of you know, empirical research done on this yet, but that is a theory that I've been reading about lately. And, and it makes sense to me actually, uh, that morning I lived in a very central location um, in my neighborhood, and that morning, when everyone realized they couldn't contact each other, people just started showing up at my house. Every every hour, the doorbell rang, you know. For and and then we end up with this group of, of ten people, you know. So it, it really it brought people together physically, which is a very important part of protest, right? Uh, we'll talk a little bit about educational issues. Let me say first a little bit about AUC. Um, the American University in Cairo is an English language, American style liberal, liberal arts college. It is 
accredited here in the states. So students that attend AUC and graduate and graduate have a diploma that has been accredited by a US accrediting body, okay? Um, some people consider it to be um, the best education you can get in Cairo. Uh, obviously, definitely, if you want uh, your education to be, to be in English. Um, but it does run a lot like an American liberal arts university. It is also expensive. So it's probably about average by our standards for a liberal arts school, maybe even a little on the lower end. But for the majority of Egyptians, it's extremely expensive. And it's out of the reach of, of you know, many, many, many Egyptians financially. So I just want to say up front that the student body there is a little bit different. It's not exactly a cross section of the population. Okay, these are, um, these are wealthier students. These are stu a lot of students that went to international schools who have already done most of their education uh, at a private school in a um, French, British, or American system. So, um, yeah, that's it's certainly not across the board. And AUC does have um, programs and scholarships in an effort to kind of to di diversify the student body. Um, but I just I just want to make clear up front that 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 student body isn't necessarily representative of the country as a whole. So um, some of my observations from teaching there are specific to that to that group of people, and and some of them are relevant to to um, a larger population. So in Egypt, the literacy rate is 66 percent. Um, the education system is very different from ours. The government provides free education at, at all levels. So um, there are government schools, pre-K through 12th grade. Um, but the, the teaching style is different. And this is, this is in the process of changing. But um, students who have gone to the government schools ha are very much used to learning by rote. They read textbooks that they're assigned, and they memorize the notes from their lecturers. And that is how they learn. That is how they're graded by being able to you know, repeat this information that they've memorized. So showing up in a, in a situation, uh, an American style university situation, where you're being asked to do a lot of research and critical thinking is a, a new experience for, for a lot of these students. Um, the, and often students will have never used a library. So in, uh, particularly in Cairo, there are, uh, uh, there are quite a few public libraries because Suzanne Mubarak, the ex-First Lady, that was, her, that was her big project. So, so internationally you can see First Ladies like libraries. Who knew? <laughs> so, uh, but there aren't a lot of school libraries. That is not as common and students generally arrive to university without having been asked to really do a lot of research or to, to um, use these critical, or develop these critical thinking skills. So access to libraries is an issue, critical thinking skills is an issue. Um, in general, there isn't, uh, there isn't a much of a book culture in, in the Arab world. Um, people read magazines, they, they read newspapers, um, but there's just not, there's not a, a book culture or a reading culture like, like we're used to. Um, now, particularly in Cairo, the, the publishing industry has increased a lot over the last few years, so that, so that is changing. But these are all, um, but these are the, the main barriers to information that I, that I observed over the last few years. So I want to talk a little bit about how, uh, how we can improve communication, how we can support dialogue between cultures. And, um, and this way, we're, we're promoting the free f flow of information, right? I think that, this is, that there's a pretty simple answer, and I think that that is developing partnerships and developing relationships and working on projects with people all over the world. Um, so, uh, I'll, and I'll give you a few exam examples of that. And I'm talking about individual partnerships, I'm talking about institutional partnerships. All, all of this are, are positive ways to, to increase communication. So, um, as I said, my, my fellowship at, at UNC Chapel Hill is focused on building partnerships between our program, the American University in Cairo, and a university in Morocco called al -Akhwain. So, um, the goal, and this, this is funded by an IMLS grant, 
And the goal is for us to develop library, like LIS education in these countries. Because at this point, in that part of the world, people are, they can, you can get a, um, I mean, you can get a, B, a BA, an undergraduate degree in library and information science, but a lot of times people are encouraged to go abroad for, for a higher education, for masters and PhDs. Um, so we're, we're developing this partnership to work with these two universities. During, while I was overseas, there is a organization called Amical, which is the, this always takes me a minute, American International, wait, American International Consortium of Academic Libraries. So this is a group of um, libraries in American style universities all over the world. Uh, AUC was a member, Akhwain in Morocco is a member. There are schools in London, in Rome, in Paris, in Russia, in Kyrgyzstan, all, all over. I think there are 27 members. And uh, Amical supports a lot of partnerships and a lot of, uh, and provides funding for projects like this. Um, in January, I spent a couple of weeks in Morocco at Akhwain University doing some consulting for them. That was funded by Amical. You know, it was a larger Amical partner providing support for a smaller Amical partner. Uh, in, um, and I was, I was working with them on their instruction program. Um, so all, all, these, all these sorts of projects are you know, opening up lines of communication, right? Um, uh, you know, obviously it's easy to say that, right? But what are the big issues? Funding, always an issue. Getting to be more of an issue every year. Uh, and making contacts, which is easier because it doesn't cost so much money, um, since it doesn't cost you anything to you know email Algeria. But um, you know, I, I, all, you know, all I'm trying to do is acknowledge it's not it's not quite as simple as I'm saying, right? Um, another another important way I think to to uh, increase this communication is by doing your research. And when I say this, I mean two different things. One is preparing yourself to work within a culture that's unfamiliar to you, right? So this is going back to um, what Dr. Abdullahi was talking about. You need to understand your own culture and you need to understand the um, cultural norms outside of your box, right? Um, and, you know, obviously you can read as much as you want and that is not going to make you completely prepared to be dropped in the middle of Cairo. It really doesn't, but it helped a lot. <laughs> um, uh, so, you know, developing your own understanding as much as possible. Secondly, um, when I say do your research, I mean this. I've learned as I have done my own research in the last few years and conducted lit reviews and this sort of thing, there's not a whole lot of, of information in existence, in English in particular. Um, I've got a little bit of Arabic and I'm working on it, but more like uh, you know giving directions to a taxi driver and less like reading a journal article. So, um, the, yeah, there's just not there is not a whole lot of information out there about these issues, particularly in the in the MENA region. In fact, as I've been doing my research, one of the best things I found was a textbook written by Dr. Abdullahi um, that was very has been very helpful. But um, so that's what I want to do now, right? I want to add to this body of literature. I want to do my own research. I want to publish that research. I want to you know, share what I learned about this part of the world, particularly in relation to information literacy. So uh, I, I will close by saying this. It's important to keep in mind that there are some barriers that I can't take on, right? That one librarian or even a group of librarians it's just too much for us. Like, um, even if we all work together, we're not going to be able to topple the bandwidth monopoly in Lebanon that causes their internet access to be some of the slowest I've ever experienced since dial-up. Right? <laughs> even if we all, you know, storm the Mugama, we're not going to be able to convince the government to free jailed bloggers. Okay? There are some issues here that are just that are that are just beyond us. Right? That doesn't mean you shouldn't be aware of them and uh, you shouldn't have a, you know, a deep understanding of these issues. Um, and regardless, individually and as a group, we can build global collections, <coughs> can share our knowledge, and we can learn from information seekers and professionals all over the world. Thank you. Let's have a round of applause for all our speakers. <laughs> so do we have questions for anyone. Remember, Dr. Lohr is still with us. Good. 
There's one. That's all right. Um, you know, I was just asked this recently. As far as my work environment, not at all. Um, and, and, you know, on campus at AUC, I believe the faculty, I think, is 40% foreign and 60% um, Egyptian. Uh, and the staff is, is very heavily Egyptian. But, um, no, I, I, never, I never felt like that was an issue at work at all. Now, outside of work, it's a different story. I mean, um, just, uh, I mean, there is, uh, street harassment is an issue there. It's a big issue. And um, if, I, you know, I tell people if, if you aren't someone who can kind of ignore that and let it roll off your back, then you probably shouldn't live there because you're not going to change an entire culture with your anger, you know. <laughs> um, but in general, it's, it's much more of an annoyance than a, than a threat. But in my work environment, um, no, I never experienced anything like that. Sure. I guess I'm not sure uh, we talk about this, but you guys talk about cultural barriers and so forth. And to me, I feel like as a minority to minority, I feel like it matters. I think sometimes as we Americans go to a broad country, if we try to support a culture, but we forget the position of the culture of the people because of some kind of entitlement, we're almost starting to prohibit happiness. Because when you go in there, you support the very little. Well, that's a very good question in many ways. And, and we are trying to address uh, this question by the way, how do we connect ourselves to the rest of the world? And how does the rest of the world look like in terms of cultures, within cultures, many times also, because there are main cultures and then there are sub, sub, subcultures called ethnic cultures in many ways. And we can only do that through education in many ways. We have to relate those realities of the world with the education that we teach in many ways. So really, it becomes also the responsibility of the instructors to move students into that territory of understanding in many ways so that we will minimize also the cultural shocks that Amanda is talking about in many ways when you go over there. You go there with understanding in many ways. If you talk about Thailand, if you talk about Ethiopia, if you talk about Sudan, or if you talk about South Africa, there are also many cultures within those, what you call ethnic traditional cultures in many ways. And that's why I started with a definition of culture so that how you prepare yourself when you are trying to establish collaboration with an institutional collaboration or individual collaboration. It requires understanding. And that what does it mean, that understanding? That means you learn about that culture so that you can communicate uh, properly in many ways. Because what I see, what I have seen, or what we see in many instances is not really proper communication. Either it is one culture dominating the other, especially the Western culture 
dominating the other, and the other culture feeling inferior or isolated or marginalized in many ways. So that is not really a good communication because a good communication requires that the receiver and the sender understand each other. The other question about libraries, of course the librarians have always uh, have to assume responsibility to educate their users also what we mean by libraries. How important is a library in the life of people? How important is the library to the community? The value of the library, not just the usage. People know only to use the library. That's what they say now there is an internet, so there won't be a use for a library because they only see it from as use. That means from accessing, not from the value. The value of the library to the community as their memory. Can you imagine if you throw out your memory, what happens to you? You can't even find a way back home, okay? So we have to teach the public the value of the library, also students in the academia, also the community, then they understand why we have the library and why the use of the library is important for them. You want to add? Um, well, I, was just, I just have a couple comments to make about about access, um, I, I was really surprised because I, um, coming from here in particular, right? I feel like Jackson is very open and very much part of the community. Um, when I got to AUC, it is the library is on lockdown. Nobody comes in who doesn't have an AUC ID. If you want to be a visiting scholar, um, you have to go through a long process of paperwork and um, getting a badge and all this sort of thing. And it, I, I guess it's less of an issue now that the campus has moved out into the desert, but, um, and, I, and I don't know, honestly, if it was different when the campus was right in the heart of Cairo in Tahrir, if it was a little more accessible to the public. Um, now the campus in general is, is less accessible. But anyway, I, I just want to make a point that I was, I was, I was surprised by that. And I think uh, probably one of the solutions here is well, I don't, I don't know if I want to say solution, but I guess what we're doing at this point is starting from the top, right? Like you said, we are, um, these uh, American universities abroad are end up educating the upper classes and the wealthier, um, uh, the wealthier, wealthier students. So I, from that point, it, you've got to, it's got to trickle down, right? You've, we, we've got an in, we're already, we're teaching students, we're teaching 5,000 students, but um, then you have that opportunity to reach out to the community, to develop partnerships um, within the community and try and provide training, try and provide access at that point. Well. Well, I mean, there are two there are two angles here, right? The one is that I, th I, I want to say that the annual tuition is fourteen thousand dollars, or around there. Muhammad, is that right? Do you know? Fifty thousand pounds. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mohammed Bure and I worked together at, at AUC, and now he's a student here at UNCG. Um, uh, so, you know, in the States, that might not be, I don't know, that's maybe average for a liberal arts education. Um, but but the, main, the main issue is just that the, you know, that, oh, there's a, there's a, when I first moved there, I don't know if this is true anymore, there's a statistic that of um, the number of Egyptians that live on under a dollar a day. Is I don't want to throw out a number because I'll be kind of making it up, but it's it's a high percentage. So, I mean, um, there's just such a, a huge majority of the population that just can't can't even approach affording that, and there's not loans to be taken out or government support or anything to attend a private private institution. Right. I guess I was thinking more about outreach, like community outreach, student projects, faculty projects, um, library-based projects, um, partnering with 
with um, people in the community. Yes, Clara. Oh, um, so I'll start. Uh, Dr. Lord Kent here. Uh, this is Clara. My question just had to do with the role of international library organizations. How can um, they, what role do they play in terms of uh, how they've advanced global librarianship? And then uh, for the students who are here, how might they participate uh, or take advantage of the knowledge that is held within these organizations? Is there oh. a there? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think can, I, can I come in? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I suppose this question is really made for me in the sense of I was, that I was involved with IFLA for, for quite a while and in fact still am involved. Um, I think there are uh, there's a whole range of ways in which um, an organization such as IFLA and similar organizations such as the International Association of School Librarians uh, and so forth uh, can play a role. Um, for, for one thing, the networking that takes place during conferences, although difficult to quantify, is incredibly valuable. The exposure of people to one another, the exposure of visitors to the host country, exposure of visitors to one another, uh, working together in standing committees uh, of, of the IFLA sections. Um, that's where the real interesting work of IFLA gets, gets done. And um, if you ever go to an IFLA Congress, remember that you're always welcome to uh, audit a, a standing committee. Uh, uh, you're welcome and you might get roped in to do a spot of work uh, if, you, if you raise your voice, which is a good, good thing. Uh, it's a way to get involved. So I think that's one one way. And then, of course, the solidarity of, of participating in programs which promote library development in developing countries, which, which promote freedom of expression and freedom of, of uh, access to information, uh, and the, the, which promote the centrality of the library in, in the information society. These are all activities which, which are, are really very, very valuable. And I would recommend that every librarian should at some stage in their career try to attend an international meeting such that, as those of if that can be a life-changing experience for you. Um, I wanted to also uh, add that um, one doesn't have to go to international conferences or belong to international organizations to get that exposure. The question was asked here, uh, why do we need to rethink and re, um, uh, reimagine the local library in a world that is increasingly international? Um, international doesn't mean uniform, and, and um, I think it's very uh, libraries, local libraries have an important role to play in making local communities aware of the complexity of the world in which they operate. The librarians, to start off, should be aware of how international decisions, such as international conventions on intellectual property rights and everything that goes with that, how those international uh, developments actually affect them at the coal face. But local libraries can play a, a useful role uh, through, for example, uh, multi multicultural programs. United States has a very diverse population. You have wonderful opportunities for multiculturalism. And there are things like system library projects, you know, where library, uh, libraries in the US can, can link up with libraries in other countries uh, where you can uh, swap information, have staff visits, have uh, programs. Lots of that is being organized through the American Library Association. I think it's a wonderful scheme. I think perhaps I'd better stop here because I think we're running out of time. Uh, yes, um, as Dr. Lor has said, the 
importance and the value of this international organizations like IFLA and uh, the ASL or the international school librarians and others are very important uh, to bring librarians together from different parts of the world that developed and developing and developed to exchange ideas, to learn from each other, to network, and so on and so forth. But I just want to add from my observation since I have been participating in, in many years and working also with librarians from developing countries, some of the concerns, for example, beside learning and networking from each other, that the, uh, this association, is especially conference or meetings, are set up with the standards from developed countries. So that means the financial, the registration, the hotels, and so on, are based on the income of the developed countries, let us say librarians. So many times, developed, developing countries librarians, they can't afford it. To, to attend this, even though they wanted to attend many times, although they find the sponsors and that kind of a thing, uh, it becomes too expensive. So I have seen many of my colleagues started to worry for the next conference based on the financial aspects rather than on the subjects or the field that they wanted to address in many ways. So that is another challenge that one has to look at. For example, when you are organizing an international conference, is this really affordable for this kind of a world? Because three-fourths of the world population, in many ways, live in developing countries, as I have said. So many times, the standard of this participation in terms of registration, in terms of hotels, and so on, should meet really in some way uh, in kind of affordability of this uh, of these countries so that most of their most of their uh, concentration i will say will be based on the issues that they wanted to address rather than the financial things that they have always to worry about but on the other side this type of organizations like ifla has a lot of value for them because by coming together, they also establish some kind of guidelines, like the uh, public library manifesto, guidelines for LIS education, and so on and so forth. And this helps also many developing countries to take these guidelines and the manifesto to their governments and try to establish some kind of a standard in library service to their own countries. So it has a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, usefulness in coming together. Just to add one a comment. Yes, go ahead. Please, um, I think that what um, Ismail has said is very, very true, and it's a, it's a big, a big challenge, and no amount of uh, uh, con Congress attendance, uh, grants, and bursaries can really ensure that everybody who deserves to be there can can attend. But there's one small, quite practical. Um, uh, a point that, that you may want to bear in mind if you organize any conferences to which you want to invite people from other countries. And that is to give them lots of advance warning. Let them know well in advance. I keep receiving invitations to conferences in various countries uh, with just a, a, a month's notice or six weeks notice that essentially precludes people from developing countries, people who do not have European passports, Ameri uh, American, Canadian, Australian, or New Zealand passports, are unable to attend conferences in those countries if they don't get plenty of advanced warning so they can start applying for visas. Because the amount of bureaucracy involved for people from developing countries to enter these uh, Western uh, fortresses uh, it's quite mind-boggling. Uh, you'll be surprised if you haven't been through that process. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay. So I'd like to thank the panelists for this wonderful uh, session that we've had, for giving us uh, your particular perspectives on international librarian issues, and also for getting us to think about some of the challenges that we have ahead, but uh, that we can make a difference in 
uh, making connections throughout the world. So I'd like to thank you again, especially Peter, for coming in from so far. And um, this uh, dialogue doesn't have to stop here because I wanted just to end by highlighting that uh, Dr. Abdullahi has published the most recent book on international and comparative librarianship, and Dr. Lohr will be coming out with his book next year. So uh, you have a lot of resources to work with uh, from the panelists here. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, Nora was going to tell us the particular breakout group so we know where to head next. So you have your red dot, or your green dot, or your blue dot, or your yellow dot. And um, Alexander, Kirkland, and Claxton rooms are on the lower level from here. So you need to go down the main staircase, and um, they're fairly easy to find um, from there. But we will also um, get some spotters out there um, ahead of you. And um, Azalea is um, on this floor, um, very close to the auditorium. So if you're um, a blue group, um, you are Azalea. So your dot should be on the front of your um, packet, and um, it will tell you what room, and there will be um, people there to lead the discussion and to bring your ideas about some of the things that the panelists said and, um, and ways that we can um, continue this dialogue. Thank you.